We were talking about the question, why are we alive? Uh, why are you here? Why are you spending 70 or 80 years on this planet? Uh, what's the purpose of your life? What's the point of being here? How did you get here? Uh, whose idea was it to put you here? Are you just a chance speck thrown up by the floods of time? Or is there some point in you being here? And that's the question we're trying to talk about. And we've mentioned that lots of people have attempted to tell us all why we're here, but they all seem to be rather suspicious characters, to say the least of it. They are either gurus that are trying to make money out of us, or they're fanatics who uh, think of themselves as uh, some great person. And uh, there is only one who stands head and shoulders above the rest and is very different from them. And he was a man, of course, that not only said that he was doing the exact actions and saying the exact words that the creator of the universe wanted him to say, but in fact he did live that kind of life. Even his greatest enemies said that they found no fault in him, and the Roman soldier that was responsible for killing him said this man certainly was the son of God. And so even his enemies attested to the fact that he not only taught the highest ethic that the world has ever heard, but he lived it. And, of course, the most important thing that sets him apart from people like Zoroaster and Confucius and Buddha and the others who claim to be able to tell us what reality is and why we're here, the one thing that sets him apart from them all is that though they all died like dogs and were buried like the rest of us and then were overcome by death, this man kept on saying that he would die, but uh, uh, on the third day he would uh, get up from being dead. And that's exactly what he did. And he lived for more than a month and appeared uh, uh, 13 or 14 times after that in different places. And, of course, appeared not as a ghost, but appeared in ways that uh, his followers and above 500 people at one time saw him uh, could tell were, was actually real. He ate breakfast with them and he let them put their fingers in the holes that the nails had made in his hands when he was crucified. And all this is recorded in manuscripts that are earlier and better in their evidence than any manuscripts concerning a person of that particular time in history. In other words, when you go to the British Museum and you see a manuscript like the Codex Alexandrinus or the Codex Sinaiticus, or you go to the Manchester University Museum and you see the Chester B.D. Papyrus that is dated 125 A.D., which is just a mere 25 or 30 years after one of his followers who knew him personally died, you find that there is better uh, documentation and better historical evidence for the existence of this man than for any other figure of that time, and uh, better than for most historical figures. And so it's necessary, if you're honest and intellectually honest, to admit that this man did live and did die and certainly all of history points to the fact that he got up from being dead and that he had power to come into life and go out of it whenever he wanted to. And this man, Jesus, explained to us why we were alive. And, of course, we've been studying his explanation for uh, some weeks, indeed some months now. And you remember one of the things that he said was that we were made by his father, the creator of the universe, to live off his father. That is, to live off the confidence that his father 
actually knew you and planned your creation and knows your name. Uh, this man, Jesus, said that his father has even numbered the hairs of your head. Now, of course, even your mum or your dad haven't counted the hairs of your head. And uh, even if you're beginning to get a little bald, uh, you know that nobody has ever done that and probably nobody ever will do it. And yet uh, this man, Jesus, said that the creator who made you has counted even the hairs of your head. He knows you as intimately as that. In other words, you have not been thrown on this earth by chance, but he planned for you to be here. And he planned for you to be here so that you would begin to live off him. That is, live off his love. Now, of course, you may say, well, I mean, you can't live off love. You have to get some of the old shekels in order to survive. Yes, but he promised that if you would, well, he put it this way, if you would seek first his kingdom, that is the domain of the king, the rule of the king in your own life, if you would seek that first, if you would concentrate on letting him explain to you what he wanted you to do with your life and why he had put you here in the world, if you would concentrate on that, then he would add, uh, this man Jesus said, all other things onto you. That is, he would take care of all the things that you needed. In fact, Jesus put it rather bluntly. He said, don't be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink or what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than raiment? Look at the lilies of the field. They don't sow or gather into barns. And yet Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? And then, of course, he explained what the problem with you and me is. He said, will he not much more clothe you, O men of little faith? And uh, he said the same about food. He said, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap. Uh, they don't do those things, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of much more value than many sparrows? And yet not a sparrow falls to the ground, but your Heavenly Father knows. And so Jesus said that we shouldn't be anxious about those things. He said, everybody's anxious about those things, but your Heavenly Father knows you have need of them. So don't be anxious. Uh, have no anxiety for anything, but concentrate on finding out what he wants you to do with your life and on doing it and you'll find that he by hook or by crook will add all these other things onto you and if you do that you'll develop more and more in your trust of him and in your knowledge of him and as you do that you will become more and more like him and as you become more like him you'll be fit for the development of the whole universe that he has planned for us after we get out of this present life. And, of course, Jesus explained that most of us have just turned our back on that kind of stuff, and we have decided, forget it. We're not going to depend on some creator up there who may come through or may not come through, and we have determined, actually, we're not going to trust him. We have determined, no, we're going to trust ourselves. Uh, we're going to make our own way in this world. And so we have concentrated on trying to get what we need from the world itself and forget all about this creator and forget about this stuff of trying to find his will for our lives and trying to find out what he wants to do and why he has put us here, we've decided we're going to make it our, on our own. Now, of course, it's the dumbest thing in the world, and you and I know it. I mean, it wouldn't work that way in a factory. If you go and you join some firm after you graduate from college or university or after you get out of school, you certainly don't get into some corner of the factory and say, oh, I'm not going to trust the boss. I'm not going to do what he wants me to do. 
I can't depend on him knowing what is right for me to do in my life. I'm going to get into this little corner and try and I'm going to try to use the resources of this factory to make what I need for myself. Well, it wouldn't work. It, it's dumb. It just won't work. But we have decided to do that with our own lives. And so most of us are trying to make it without him. Let's talk tomorrow about the effects of that.